All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Bienvenidos. Thank you for the brave Spaniards who chose this session in English over the other ones in Spanish. Um, so quick introduction. I'm Stefana Raelano. I work for Intel. I've been with Intel for almost five years in different roles, but always working with AI. And this is what we will talk about today. We will talk about some um, tips and tricks for improving performance of AI and also about how Intel is trying to build an open ecosystem and how can you can also contribute. Um, so let's see what's on the menu today. I will talk about One API and the UXL Foundation. How many of you have heard about the One API or the UXL Foundation before? All right, so we'll talk about why it's relevant. Uh, for AI. And then, as I said, we'll talk about some tools and technologies. I'll try to cover um, several domains that are part of AI, not just generative AI, which right now, obviously, it's very popular. Um, we'll talk about the Intel Tiber developer cloud, about what it is and what it's not. And finally, we'll talk about the open platform for enterprise AI um, and the community that we are trying to build for generative AI solutions. All right, so um, let's get started with One API. So, what is One API? It's a programming model. This doesn't help us understand uh, very well what is indeed. But if we ask why One API, why did Intel decide to invest in One API? It's to build this unified programming model that allows for you to um, build applications that can run on heterogeneous infrastructure. So recently, you're probably aware that the GPUs have started being used more and more and are part of supercomputers, and everybody is trying to do AI workloads and accelerate them with GPUs, the most popular accelerator, but there are other type of specified accelerators as well. There are also FPGAs. Now, with one API, what you can do is you can program all of this with the same programming model. So it evolves around SQL, which is a standard, and the implementation of it is data parallel C++. So probably some of you will wonder why is this relevant for me. For me, I am a Python developer. I work with TensorFlow and so on and so forth. Uh, why do I want to care about one API and what does it have to do with what I'm doing? Well, um, except for building the deep C++ implementation of SQL, you can see here that there are a lot of libraries that are ready to use for developers for different use cases. One of them, obviously, is AI. Now, you see there are libraries that start with one, such as one DNN, one CCL. These are libraries that are being leveraged by other higher level frameworks and libraries that you use day to day. One DNN stands for one deep neural networks, and essentially, it implements all those components. And for instance, if you're a user of TensorFlow PyTorch, in the latest versions, you have it already um, turned on by default. So you are already taking advantage of one DNN. Another library that is very important is one CCL. Essentially, if you're um, interested or already working on training large language models and the distributed training that is often necessary when we're talking about huge models, then you are using one CCL as a library to distribute. And this is in the backend used for um, tools such as DeepSpeed or Horovod that you might be familiar with. Now the question might be, okay, but what, how can I um, take advantage of that given that it's already included in TensorFlow or PyTorch and so on and so forth. So uh, what I'll talk later is some of the things that are not upstreamed, but you can take advantage of today and you can get that extra boost in performance. Now, what is the UXL Foundation? It's the evolution of one API. So obviously for, for it to, um, to be used and for it to be useful for the industry, it needs to be um, developed. And therefore, as part of the UXL Foundation, there are many other companies such as ARM and Fujitsu uh, and Qualcomm that are contributing to it. And from one API, a lot of the libraries such as those that I mentioned earlier, one DNN and so on, they have been donated to the UXL Foundation, which is under Linux Foundation, and therefore building um, um, software that is not, um, that is vendor neutral. Why is this important nowadays? 
obviously we have um, you know the um, Nvidia GPUs, we have Gaudi accelerators, we have AMD GPUs that are used for AI, and we will see more and more accelerators. If everybody comes out with their own uh, closed source um, framework for development, then it becomes very fragmented. Now you as a company, you might have your developers only code in one um, programming model. And then when you want to switch, you might have to uh, waste a lot of time on migrating it and you might have difficulties in case you want to, to do that. Now for one API, what you can do is you can do uh, the coding in one platform and then you can do the fine tuning for specific devices because obviously CPUs and GPUs, they have different architectures and you want to optimize for, for those. Okay, so today's session is going to be focused mostly on the software side, but I wanted to give a brief overview of some of the hardware offerings from Intel for different use cases. And one of the most important offerings right now are the Gaudi accelerators. Now, what are the Gaudi accelerators? Essentially, their target is deep learning. Unlike the GPUs, which are meant for general acceleration, you can use it for AI, you can use it for HPC. Gaudi are specific accelerators for deep learning. And obviously nowadays targeted a lot of at transformers and at generative AI. So if you're dealing with um, large language models uh, or if you want to do training, then this would be the best um, accelerator. If you have other use cases that require accelerator that are not related to deep learning, you also have the um, GPU Max um, series, which are essentially um, AI accelerators and HPC accelerators. Where can you get access to them? That's what I will talk about later. Now, something else here that I want to mention is that except for the deep learning acceleration and for the general acceleration, they are the traditional CPUs. So typically, um, GPUs are used to accelerate AI, especially when we talk about training. Now, what happens is that CPUs have evolved a lot in their recent years. So they are not the traditional um, CPUs that we have 10 years ago. We included instructions such as vector instructions and the latest one are matrix instructions that are used for those deep learning workloads. For instance, how many of you have heard about AVX 512 or AMX? So these are instructions that are built into Xeon processors. We define Xeon processors in the public cloud. Whenever you um, choose um, any of the Intel instances, they're probably going to be Xeon. And the AVX 512 and the AMX can be used through one API in your TensorFlow or PyTorch code. And later on, I will talk about what has already been upstreamed and what might need a few um, tweaks for you to take advantage of. All right, and um, on the AI PC, AI personal computer, um, except for the traditional CPU and GPU, we also have an NPU. This NPU is very efficient. Um, obviously, this being one of uh, the biggest advantages of the fact that a lot of uh, AI workloads can be offloaded to it, and therefore you can use your CPU and GPU for other um, workloads. All right, so now let's talk about software. So you can see here, there's some third party logos. So obviously this hasn't been developed by Intel, but we've worked with them in order to um, make sure that the performance um, is improved. So TensorFlow takes advantage of one DNN, which is what I mentioned earlier. Then you, we have libraries such as scikit-learn. Um, we also have a framework called OpenVINO. For those of you who might've been here last year, there was a presentation on, on this framework. Um, so essentially this is for optimizing your model and for deploying it. One of the advantages is using it at the edge. It started as a, as a visual inference tool. And the advantage is that you can take advantage of all the computing power that you have in an edge device. For instance, as I said, you have a CPU, you have a GPU, you have an NPU or a VPU, you can take advantage of all those. And you can benchmark it and decide What's the, what's the best use case for you? Again, if you can take advantage of a, um, a neural processing unit, for instance, then you have a low power device, which sometimes at the edge is very important. Now, of course, OpenVINO has evolved along with the industry and right now has a lot of optimized large language models that you can take advantage of. And of course, we collaborate with um, libraries and um, 
communities such as Hugging Face. And later on, I'll talk about the uh, open platform for enterprise AI as well. But before that, let's start with Python. So how many of you are Python developers or uh, have had any experience with Python? Okay, great. So <laughs> I have good news. If you want to take advantage of one API, but you want to stay with, uh, within the Python ecosystem, we have the Intel distribution for Python. What it does is it contains wrappers around uh, one API libraries, such as um, MOF kernel library and data analytics library so that you can get that boost in performance without having to do your own builds or even change your code. Um, so as part of Intel distribution for Python, there's the optimizations for the very popular libraries such as NumPy and SciPy. Um, and then there are the data parallel extensions for Python, which again, they follow the same principle as one API. You can code once and you can code for CPU, which you can actually already do in, uh, with traditional Python, and then you can code on GPUs as well. If you're wondering how to get Python, you can get it as a standalone version, and you can also get it for Conda. You can get the full distribution. If you get the full distribution, you will get a lot of libraries such as NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, and all the optimizations. But of course, many of you want to customize it, so you could go ahead and just install the libraries that you're interested in. If you work with Scikit-Learn, for instance, you can just get the Scikit-Learn and the Scikit-Learn extension, which I'll mention uh, later on. If you want to make sure that you have everything working um, perfectly for your first test, then you can install the full distribution. Okay, so what are data parallel extensions for Python? As you can see here, there are three tools that are included. The first one is data parallel NumPy. So this is essentially NumPy, where the same API is being used, so your code doesn't change at all. You just do an import DPMP, SMP, and then you use your NumPy. So some of you might be familiar with KuPy, and you know that KuPy is supported on GPU devices. DPMP support is for CPU and GPUs, and there's also a guide how you can run it on NVIDIA GPUs as well. So the idea is to build these tools and extend the support for all the existing hardware that is widely used by the developers. Again, the advantage is that you get significant improvement. With no change of code, just by installing it and the drop in replacement, um, you can get uh, significant improvement, which I'll, I'll share a bit later. Then you have data parallel control. Um, essentially, as the library suggests, is for you to have more control. So if you work with heterogeneous devices, again, CPUs, GPUs, you want to make sure that the memory is used in a very efficient way, then the data parallel control is your library. So you don't have to go to sickle. You don't have to go to the lower level to code um, everything and to have this control. On the other side is uh, Numba Deepex. So Numba is a just-in-time compiler. Python is not famous for the best performance, and therefore Numba is a compiler that helps improving it. Um, traditional Numba only supports CPUs, but there's a huge advantage in actually doing it on GPU. And so for Numba Deepex, you can do it on GPUs as well. OK, so this is um, one of the uh, performance graphs that I have prepared for today. And in this case, we're talking about fast Fourier transformations. So we're talking about the data processing and working with data at this point, not about training and inference, um, which we'll talk about later. So these are functions that are used widely for various workloads. They can be used for um, speech uh, processing, image processing, um, and so on. And so you can see here, you can get up to 140 times. So we're not talking about percentages, we're talking about x times of improvement that you can get, in this case, only by using the optimized NumPy. So you don't have to um, install the whole distribution. You can just install the, the NumPy from the Intel channel, and you can get this improvement. OK, next, I'll talk about the scikit-learn extension. Um, so maybe you're tired of me asking questions. So I'll just assume that many of you have used scikit-learn. So as you can see here, one line of code, one patch, and again, you can get a very nice improvement. So we've had um, various ways to optimize it over time, and we found out that this is the easiest way 
you can patch the the whole code if you want or if you can you, if you want you can patch certain sections of a code um, so all you need to do is install a scikit-learn extension and add this two lines of code of course the improvement will depend on what you're using it for. So depending on the algorithm that you're using, you'll get a different uh, performance improvement. And here is what I mean. So these are some of the algorithms that are optimized right now. And in every release, we're working on adding more and more. And this is the um, estimated performance boost that you can get. So as you can see here, you can get up to 2,000 times um, on the left side, you have training. On the right side, you have inference. So you can get this improvement again just by adding two lines of code. And how do you get this improvement? Well, remember one API, the scikit-learn extension is using one DAL, which is part of a one API, so that you can get this um, in your Python code. OK, now let's move to deep learning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 1DNN, it's already been upstreamed. Um, TensorFlow um, version 2, there was a different distribution uh, from Intel. Starting with version 2.9, you have it turned on by default. You can take advantage of certain debugging uh, tools, for instance, that are part of 1DNN. Um, and then another uh, usage uh, for Intel extension for TensorFlow and Intel extension for PyTorch given that 1DNN has already been upstreamed, is a support for GPUs. So if you're interested in using Intel GPUs, we're also working on upstreaming it, but you can get um, support using this extensions. In addition to GPU support, you can get some extra CPU improvements. So as I said earlier, although we're working on upstreaming and 1DNN has been upstreamed, there's still extra um, improvements that you can get. Um, today I have the example of PyTorch. Again, I wasn't going to write a lot of code. I just wanted you to see how simple it is uh, for you to take advantage of, um, of some of its optimizations. So when we talk about the Intel extension for PyTorch, you can use it for both CPU and GPU. And uh, this is one of the APIs that hasn't been upstreamed. So if you're using large language models, um, as you can see here, with one line of code, you can um, already optimize it. Of course, your question might be, but which models? There are a lot of models. Well, you can find this in the documentation, but rest assured that most of the popular ones and most of the open source ones, they are uh, part of it. And moving on to Hugging Face. Um, Again, as you know, Hug and Face has one of the biggest AI communities. Um, there's a lot of models and, and uh, data sets that um, they offer, along with the Transformers library and um, the Optimum uh, tool for optimization. So there are various Optimal tools um, for different vendors. There is also Optimum Havana for Gaudi accelerators, if you're interested. But here are the two Optimum Intel tools for the Neural Compressor and OpenVINO. Um, so what is Neural Compressor? As the name suggests, the idea is to compress it or to optimize the models. And so how do you do that? Well, a popular way to do that is using quantization, for instance. Um, and there are different ways to do uh, weight compression. The idea is that when you quantize and when you compress the models, um, obviously, you might lose accuracy. This is why there's a lot of research and there's a lot of new methods on how to do it so that you don't lose that much accuracy, so that your model is smaller, but at the same time, it performs well. Now, of course, sometimes you can um, do certain weight um, reduction up until in four, I believe that's the, the smallest um, precision right now that is used. And you won't get the best accuracy no matter how much you tried. But in some cases, you have no option because if you're using it on a small device and you do want a large language model, then you will have to find a way to fit that in memory. Um, except for that, there's also um, an API from Neural Compressor that helps build distilled models. So if you use um, um, models like BERT, for instance, you probably know about distilled BERT. So you probably know about the fact that um, the role of um, distilled BERT is to, um, for instance, do something like text classification. And it's good enough at the same time being a smaller version. So in order for you not to use a huge model for a use case, you can just um, use a smaller one. So it's like a student learning from um, 
the teacher. So this is the process called distillation, and using the neural compressor you can do that. And if you use the Optimum Intel, you don't have to use it separately, you can just use it through Hugging Face. Okay, another tool um, that you probably haven't heard of and um, historically hasn't really been advertised as a tool for AI, but that we're building right now to offer as much help to developers as possible for both AI and Python workloads is Vtune. Um, so this is a free software that you can install and you can do profiling of your code. Um, now we've built support for Python so that you can easily add some um, APIs to check the performance of Python codes and especially to check um, the issues, the bottlenecks and the, um, the hot workloads that you might have. We have some guides for how to use it for Python. We have some guides on how to use it for PyTorch. We're building some for how to use it for with data parallel extensions. You can also use it to check why sometimes you get such a nice improvement when you use DPMP instead of, instead of NumPy. And um, obviously we're building to add more and more uh, guides for different uh, machine learning workloads. Okay, now what is Intel Tiber Developer Cloud? So Intel Tiber Developer Cloud is not another pub public offering and it's not meant to be an alternative for other uh, big cloud uh, providers that you know, but this is the platform where you can get access to the latest hardware. So sometimes to the hardware that is not yet in the market. How does it help you? Well, you can start development, developing your applications and you can get ready for you can actually get access to it either through public cloud or um, through on-premise hardware and so on. And so in the Intel Tiber Developer Cloud, as I said, you'll find uh, Gaudi accelerators. Of course, they're very high demand, like all the um, big accelerators right now for, for AI. You will also find um, GPUs, such as the Max GPUs and the Flex GPUs, which are the medium series. And then you will have uh, Xeon processors that I mentioned earlier. They have AVX512 instructions and AMX instructions, and therefore you can take advantage of that to improve your uh, deep learning workloads. AVX512 are also used for um, scikit-learn, for instance, or, or XGBoost, which is something I didn't mention before, but we have optimizations similar to the scikit-learn extensions for XGBoost as well. Um, so what would be the advantage of it? You get access to a lot of hardware, you don't get access anywhere else. Um, and this hardware is typically um, very well priced. And at the same time, you have access to something similar to maybe the collab that you're used to. Um, so it's a Jupyter environment where you can test a lot of um, Jupyter notebooks, some of them that have already been prepackaged for you. And um, you can also bring your own uh, Jupyter notebooks. Um, so these are some of, the, um, uh, some of the notebooks you can get there. And you will have access to run it on Xeon CPUs. I believe it's the fourth generation and max GPUs. So you can also test that hardware for free. Um, okay. And um, finally, let's talk about the open platform for enterprise AI. So as you can see here, uh, this has been announced at um, Intel Vision uh, this year, and you can see some of the uh, companies that are part of it, um, such as Hugging Face, uh, which we've mentioned earlier. And the idea is, again, to build a community of developers who contribute to AI solutions for Gen AI, which are very popular right now, and everyone wants to implement them, um, so that these solutions can work on various vendors. So for now, you'll find um, some of the solutions for RAG applications, some of the chat applications, um, and you can also contribute um, to some of the Gen AI components, um, even, even today, if, if you want to. So um, this is um, a community that is, that is open, and um, it's still in its initial stage. So there's still a lot of support needed from the community and there are still a lot of applications that, that you will find. Uh, you'll find that typically these are based on a lot of popular large language models, uh, a lot of popular vector databases and so on and other components. And another important component that this takes into consideration is security. So it makes sure that whatever solution is there is also secure. All right, so uh, we're coming to the end of our presentation. So 
some of our conclusions based on something that we've, uh, some of the things we've seen today. So there's a broad portfolio to power the full breadth of AI. And as you've seen, we talk about the edge devices and then you have tools from the software side such as OpenVINO. Um, then obviously you have some of the accelerators like Gaudi or GPU Max series that power, for instance, Aurora, one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. Um, and of course the IPC or any personal computer that you might have that might have without your knowledge instructions such as AVX512 or AVX2. How do you take advantage of those instructions? Well, making sure you use either the latest software um, that is powered by, by one API. There are obviously tools that you can use to um, check, for instance, flags that you can add to check if your AMX is turned on and so on and so forth. Um, but as I said earlier, typically by using the latest software and latest hardware, you, you will um, take advantage of it, be it in the cloud or on-premise. Um, we've also shown how to accelerate it. There are many other ways and many other tools that we've accelerated. Um, you could also check it on, on our documentation. And as you've seen, first priority is to upstream. So first priority is for you to be able to take advantage of all these optimizations without having to do a lot of extra work. Also, this helps make sure that everything is validated, that you don't install something that breaks anything, and so on and so forth. But Upstreaming sometimes is not possible and sometimes does not make sense. For instance, if you want to build a hardware that will support any other possible vendor and we ship it to you and you only want to run it on one vendor, obviously this might be a bit too much. So this is why sometimes you will have to customize and you will have to add some of our libraries. But what we're trying to do is to at least make sure that this is a great experience, that this is as easy as possible for you. Now, I'm working with both development teams um, to help them build these tools and with customers. So I try to get the feedback from our customers and our developers to make sure that it is heard and it is implemented in our tools. So obviously, if you have feedback, if you have good or bad experience, please let me know. All right, we talk about the Intel Tiber Developer Cloud. Again, as I said, there are free offerings as part of it. And so um, you can make an account and you can try it out. Um, again, you can uh, give your suggestions. Um, you can use some of the uh, tools we have prepared for you, or you can um, do your own tests. And finally, again, be part of our community. Same as you are part maybe right now already, Transformers and Hugging Phase and so on and so forth. Um, build part of, uh, of OPIA and help us build um, these solutions for AI and make sure they're secure and make sure that, that they are open and they can be used by anyone. Thanks a lot for your time and that's all from my side.